Welcome to another edition of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I am the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. I'm also the creator of the public speaking course called Teach the Geek to Speak. And you can learn about it at teachthegeek.com. Today, my guest is Sarba Roy, and she is a product security staff engineer. I have no clue what that means. So I certainly will be asking her what that means during our time together. She's also cybersecurity content creator for AXA Cyber and a founding member and ambassador of Women H2H. I certainly will ask her about those too. So it seems like a bit of questions I need to get through. So let's get started. Welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Sarba. Thank you very much for having me, Neil. So from the bit of research I did on you, I saw that your background is in computer science and engineering. What motivated you to go down that path? Yeah, so um, I was always uh, interested in, uh, uh, I was always curious from my childhood. I, um, whether uh, when I started off in school, um, we I got introduced to um, uh, literature and then science and everything. So what, uh, and, uh, I mean, it was maybe when I was like almost 10 years old, I saw my first computer. And back then we had those basic uh, games like Logo and all of that, where you could do some basic bit of programming and stuff. What um, made me very curious about computer science in general was that it enabled you to create stuff that can actually change the world. So... In a way, I was always uh, inspired to like study computer science uh, because that gave you a tool to make some difference in the world. Oh, wow. I remember when my family got its first computer. I wasn't, yeah. I don't even think I was allowed to, to touch it much. <laughs> I think it was only, my, only my parents were allowed to do anything with it. So yeah. the fact that when you got your first computer in the house that you were even able to do things with it, kudos to your parents. <laughs> <laughs> yeah kudos to them actually <laughs> yeah for sure so you know i did mention that you you work as a product security staff engineer and i i did yeah. said i wasn't really sure what that means but i yeah. suspect it has something to do with cybersecurity. am i right and, and if so what what even got you into that yeah so that's a very interesting journey um product security is like a super set of different areas within cyber security so there's a little bit of um, uh, oversight uh, into security um, development into architecture into uh, operations and so on so uh, within my role i'm more into the governance security governance role within product security where we have an oversight of the different uh, uh, stages in the product secure development life cycle um, of the organization that I'm part of. So um, this is a very interesting role and it's also upcoming now because you don't see a lot of people having this role, but this will be an important um, way for people within cybersecurity to learn about different areas in cybersecurity. So uh, I would say it's a very interesting role to explore if anyone is interested. So, so. When, when you first start, well, well, when you stop, when you finish university, when you finish your, your college, your education, was yes. it cybersecurity that you went into right away or, oh, yes. so you, okay, so you've been in cybersecurity this entire time. Yes. Okay. Yes. Wow. Okay. Okay. You're the first person I've spoken to where, where that's the case. Where, yeah. Okay. That's, 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 that's very interesting. So what is it about cybersecurity that you find the most interesting and, and maybe the, the parts of it that not so much? Well, um, I would say cybersecurity is one of those areas within um, the tech industry where uh, it has so many different aspects to it. So if you're interested in uh, breaking stuff and in order to like um, just figure out how uh, to secure your applications by breaking them, you can pursue the path of offensive security where you uh, either become a pen tester or you become a malware uh, uh, researcher or you try to defend uh, or you can also pursue the path where you're trying to uh, 
secure your applications by coding it in the right way so you can pursue that path if you are interested in a high level overview of how you can protect your applications from uh, the beginning itself you can become a security architect uh, sometimes you can also be move into governance risk and compliance where you have an oversight of the different areas of cyber security so the sheer fact that this uh, field gives you so many options to explore and you can always switch and do different things learn different things and not even a single day in this field is like boring because there are so many new things you could just get to learn so if you're curious this will be like the best field you can pursue but having said that i think this also gets a little overwhelming where you each day you realize that you don't know a lot there's so much more to learn so that's where i would say that you just need to keep motivating yourself to stay relevant and stay uh, keep learning yeah what kind of background do you need to have to go into cybersecurity well the good news is uh, there is no definition of this background because uh, if you look at some of the people who have done really great in this field uh, many of them have come from liberal arts some have uh, also come with a computer science degree so there's no real definition of what it takes to be in this field but having said that uh, if you have to work there are also such, some, sometimes organizations they lay out certain requirements for people to get in but right now there are so many certifications there so there are so many boot camps so many uh, degrees that you can just pursue so it's it's not impossible to pivot into this uh, field and people have done that even after a big career gap in their uh, like professional journey as well so uh, but and also the good part is the number of uh, people who are required to work in this field is go growing phenomenally so there's always going to be requirement for new people to join in so that also gives people an added advantage to explore their interest in this field you know it's it's interesting when you when i asked about the background you're saying that there's not necessarily a background but the it it still seems that there are certain places where they prefer a certain background over another i had a, a friend who had well he, he had a, a podcast i hope it comes back at some point and he talks a lot to people who are in the tech space who yeah. came from coding boot camps they don't have the the computer science or engineering background that you have but they've been able to move within organizations having this coding background or i guess it's more non-traditional background to you know, move up into these in these organizations so it's yeah. it's good to know it's good to know that at least some organizations see the benefit yes. of perhaps not need not necessarily needing the computer science and engineering background to move in, into cybersecurity or any other aspects of tech although i, I will ask you mm -hmm. even because you have this this background in computer science and engineering would you ever suggest that people get that background to maybe have it easier in moving in in cybersecurity yeah the, um, to answer your question i think that also depends on which area in cyber security folks want to get into so uh, there's also a great um, area of like cyber security marketing and sales and then there's also um, content creation in this field so depending on which area of cyber security so if you want to for example get into malware research or into um, secure coding or into like um, pen testing or security analysis then having some background into computer science and into how stuff work and how stuff breaks and how you can fix it that can certainly help but having said that that is not not aggregating criteria i mean uh, you can always if you have that desire you can go ahead and pursue it so uh, well when it comes to the actual jobs that people that work in cybersecurity do yeah. how much how much are companies uh, at least in your opinion how much are companies willing to invest in teaching the people what they need to know to do their job as opposed to them coming in right away knowing what needs to be done uh, and this is just my opinion so it's not representative of any organization but i would say companies are doing a lot 
to actually uh, create awareness on cybersecurity and also to increase the competency of their employees who are in this field because this is such a dynamic field so many things are changing so many new vulnerabilities are coming in the attack surface is increasing tremendously so i would say uh, organizations are also putting their efforts to educate their employees on this and increase their competencies all right that that certainly would make sense especially since you said that there's a great need for more people to get yes. into cybersecurity so if that's the case then the companies at least it would be in their best interest to look at people look at people that perhaps don't have all the requirements but are willing to learn and 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 you know just go go through it that way so that, that certainly makes sense you know i i mentioned in the intro also sorry but that you're you're involved with access cyber what was the motivation to start contributing to that yeah so um, when i moved to the us i was uh, uh, i took a break from work for a bit uh, because um, of some reasons and that's the time when uh, well, access cyber uh, gautam sharma who's like the editor in chief so he gave me this opportunity to contribute to this platform where i could uh, write stuff and it's actually a great uh, way for people to con uh, just it's a great platform uh, dedicated for creating the next generation of cybersecurity defenders and uh, there's a lot of free resources uh, which they are trying to collate and share with people so that they can learn so that prompted me um, and i think since a while i have not been able to contribute very regularly but i still like support the platform and i'm hoping to contribute more uh, in the future as well okay wonderful and then i also mentioned that you're involved with women h2h what's your involvement there and how did you get involved with them yeah so i was one of the founding members for women heart to heart and that was uh, focused on like bringing together women uh, who are uh, inspired with with this idea of changing the world so um, it's a great organization and uh, since a while i think i have also um, uh, taken a break there and i have started becoming more active in women in cyber security so that's the platform where i'm currently uh, very involved with i'm uh, a big supporter and uh, i would like to like share about it to people so apart from that there is there are two more other organizations that i would like to uh, like people to know so there is empower her cyber security which is a community for women of color in cyber security it's an amazing platform by tia hopkins like who has started it and there are some phenomenal women there and then there is breaking barriers for women in cyber security uh um, so these three organizations currently i'm uh, very, very active in and i just uh, they're doing some phenomenal work all right i got you women heart to heart empower her cybersecurity and breaking barriers for women in cybersecurity yes. all right that last one's very descriptive and quite a mouthful but you definitely get the sense of what they're all about so yes. i appreciate that that type of, of title for for an organization can yes. i tell you a story sarba yeah this whole platform for teach the geek was started because of my own struggles giving presentations in front of people mm -hmm. and i had to give them in front of of management when, during my second job the first job i never talked to anybody it was i really liked but that second one <laughs> every month i had to give a presentation in front of senior management and those first few presentations were absolutely horrendous i i didn't know it was that possible i didn't know it was possible to suck that badly at communicating in a language that was my first language <laughs> so, so i'm curious is 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 speaking in front of others something that you've always been good at and if not what do you do to get better at it yeah and thank you for sharing your story neel um and i relate to it a lot so uh, i also i'm like an am ambivert so most of the time if you see me in a party or something you might see me in a corner not speaking to anyone and just being in my own cocoon but there are times when if i feel passionate about a topic i would like like i love sharing it with others and that gives me a feeling of happiness and fulfillment so uh, for me public speaking uh, was always an issue and i i started uh, uh, like 
participating in Toastmasters International, which is this uh, worldwide organization that promotes public speaking and helps you. So that helped me a lot. I did the competent communicator track where I had to deliver 10 speeches in front of like a room full of people. So one of the key learnings for me there was whenever you're presenting something, treat it like a story that you want to share with others. Uh, and when you put in that perspective, whether even if it's like a report that you're presenting it for others, Treat it like a story so that you're involved and then you know what are the things you want to talk to people about and also keep your audience in mind, figure out what your audience is and uh, what is it in them in uh, that will help, what is it in them in your talk that will help them. So if you focus on those points, I think that's when you can connect to your audience engage with them uh, do, like they're not going to kill you if you do not say something right so engage with them uh, also after every presentation try to get feedback from people you trust and or just ask for feedback try to improve on those things and uh, uh, that's where you keep growing uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I fully agree with what you're saying, Sar, but I was a member of Toastmasters too. And yeah. you're right, it's a great, it's a great form to practice your public speaking skills. Yes. And and I think you're right. In most cases, the audience is on your side. They they don't want to see you do poorly. Although yeah. I can I can recall some instances in which that wasn't the case at all. Actually, it'll be a it'll be a, an episode of this podcast that I'll be putting out maybe in the next few weeks. I was talking with a, a professor and he and I mentioned and we were talking about the conference talks uh, yeah. often that these professors and their grad students have to to do. And yeah. in many instances, you may have someone from a competing lab in the audience and they're trying to ask you questions that you maybe have not considered because they want to make you look foolish because they want to get all the grant money for themselves. <laughs> so that's an instance in which the audience may not be on your side. But, but for the most part, that's maybe that's the exception, not the rule. The majority of times, the, the audience does want to see you do well. And I really like your points about telling a story, about, yeah. about getting feedback, and then also yeah. keeping the audience's needs and desires in mind when you're putting right. your presentation together. I think that's really smart, especially if you know, your, your goal is to impart something, you, you certainly want to understand where the audience is and where they're coming from before you, you, you know, you put pen, before you even start putting your presentation together. So I think that's, I think it's smart. So when it comes to the presentations that you have to do, yeah, do you have a process for putting them together? And if so, what is it? Yeah, and thanks for asking this question. Um, I try my best to be as diligent as possible. So whenever I know that if someone is giving me their time to like listen to what I say, they're putting investing in me. So that's when I want to try my best to do my best to ensure that they learn or they have a good time when they are engaging with me. So first thing that I do is I try to outline what I'm trying to speak. I try to break it into small chunks. Uh, so that uh, I don't like elongate a particular segment for a long time. I break uh, my content into small stuff. And then I also try to get a uh, feel of what, what, which kind of audience am I speaking to? What are they expecting? And I try to uh, structure my presentation based on my audience. And another important thing that I do is um, whenever I'm, researching something and I'm finding some useful material, uh, I try to also provide reference to those because uh, that's something I think which is very important. And you may not like know everything, but whenever you're taking help from others, you should give them credit and provide reference to their, those things. And at the end of the presentation, uh, I think something that I've learned is should also do a survey uh, like at the beginning so that you, you engage with the audience. You start with the personal story so that you're able to give that personal connect with the audience. And then uh, at the end, you also give them some intentions through which 
they can use your um, the learning that you imparted in their own uh, walks of life so it could be like in a month's time what do you want them to do in a few weeks time what do you want them to do that at least also gives them the road ahead to um, use your like the learning that they have got from your presentation yeah i think that's a i think that's a really great tip and when it comes to presentations is you know, yeah. I sat through this presentation for however long. Yeah. What am I supposed to do with this information? <laughs> Hopefully yeah. it's some, something that's useful, because if not, then there's other ways I could have been spending my time as opposed yeah. to listening to you talk. <laughs> so I think that's really smart when you're putting your presentation together to kind of keep that in mind. So I, I think that's, that's, that's impressive. So another question I have when it comes to giving presentations, I mentioned when I first started doing them, I wasn't yeah. very good at it and I used to sweat quite a lot. It was uh, it was actually kind of gross. I was, I was really nervous before I, I went up there and, and presented in front of people. Do you ever get nervous before giving a presentation? And if so, how do you deal with your nerves? No, and I relate to you and recently uh, like the presentation that I had at a conference, a lot of things went wrong, like technically, like uh, my, uh, the projector sometimes did not, initially did not work. And then uh, my, con my thumb drive where I had the presentation broke and a lot of things just goofed up. But thankfully, just before the presentation started, uh, everything fell into place. So uh, I was like, my heart was like pounding when I started the presentation. But then um, I think I started with my story of how important this presentation was for me, because maybe in my lifetime, I will not get similar opportunities like this to present to this audience, which was there. So. And I believe in this Japanese philosophy of Ichigo Ichigi A, which translates to that this moment shall never return. So whenever you are giving this presentation, realize that this moment will never return. So you have nothing to really lose. So try your best, make the most of what you are there. And a lot of things fell into place for you to actually be there and present it before your audience. So just keep that in mind and Another thing is in the audience, sometimes there are a few friendly faces which keep smiling at you or which acknowledge what you are saying. So if you are getting a little overwhelmed, try to keep your eye contact with those friendly faces once in a while. They give you a sense of reassurance that you are on the right path. So. I, I really like that, that Japanese saying, this moment will never return. So yes. in the event that you suck really bad, at least it's going to go, it's, it, won't, it, it won't be something that, that, that will continue on. And hopefully the people in the audience have short memories and don't remember the <laughs> fact that you really were that, you really were that good. <laughs> mm -hmm. But you're, 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 I, I, I like that. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to, I'm going to really remember that one. This, this moment will never return. I like it. So I, from the bit of research, I also saw from the research I did on you, Sarba, that you're a folk artist. Is that right? Yes. Oh, wow. That's so interesting. How'd you get into that? So um, uh, I found a great way of um, outlet through art where um, each time if I felt low, instead of like watching a movie or just spending my time doing nothing, I thought if I can engage in something and my husband gifted me a pair of like acrylic paints, a group, a box of acrylic paints. And that's when there was a lot of waste cardboard. So I thought why not use it and get inspired by folk art which is not like a very sophisticated form of art, but it's the art which people in the general world do it across the world. So I started engaging in that. And uh, here you can see some of my uh, random paintings, which I have done. Uh, but in a way, it's a great way for me to, uh, um, it's a great creative outlet and it also helps me uh, stay inspired uh, by beauty around the world. So. Wow, that's pretty cool. It's, it's, it's nice that you have this. It's, it's, inter it's interesting how, how humans are. We kind of have, we can very well have two sides to ourselves. So you, yes. you definitely have this technical side, which which, which obviously is, is in cybersecurity. But then you have this non-technical side, which is making paintings. And I think that's that's nice to have that creative outlet. And, and, just, and not just that, but to see that 
just because you're you, you do one thing you don't necessarily have to focus all the time on that one thing which in your case would be cybersecurity as i mentioned you have this other outlet this creative outlet that you can access whenever you whenever you care to so kudos for you for for following that passion of yours thank you for, for your kind words neil <laughs> <laughs> so the i guess second to last question i would have is for anyone who's watching or listening to our conversation and yeah. they want to improve in be, being more effective at communicating with others what what would your number one tip be um i would say that uh, in this world where there are so many uh, so social media for example is like a mic in our hand which is like uh, and people uh, before our generation did not have this opportunity to share their ideas to such a diverse group of people so the fact that you have and in this uh, at this point of time you have this ability to share your thoughts and ideas with the larger world so use it wisely because it's a great power so with great power comes great responsibility so use it wisely but use it because you never know whatever you share uh, which is for the benefit of the world it can benefit someone uh, out there so at least once a week have this resolution that you want to maybe share some learning resources or you want if you can't have the time to create your own resources share the good work that others are doing so that you create we create this world where we are just learning and sharing from each other so i think that would be my number one tip uh, and and when it comes to communicating with others also um, be yourself you don't have to be look, because there are uh, so many people who are great speakers who are charismatic personalities so you might sometimes get overwhelmed that maybe i'm not that good enough there are also a lot of normal people normal people like me and others who are also maybe using this time to just share things with others so there are you you don't have to be perfect at anything so whatever you are you are amazing so use that opportunity to just communicate your ideas to others. So. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Sora, but if you're chasing perfection, you'll fail because perfection yeah. doesn't even exist. And I, and I really like the the advice of being yourself because what, what's the alternative? Being a carbon copy of someone else, probably mm -hmm. not the best way to go because the carbon copy is never as good as the original. So be yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my this is my last question, Sora, but how can people get in touch with you? Um, they can uh, easily get in touch with me through LinkedIn. So uh, uh, you can just, uh, I think there's just one survey on LinkedIn, but <laughs> you can find me on LinkedIn and that would be the best way. Um, to Excellent. Yeah. Okay, well, that marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. I also created the public speaking course, Teach the Geek to Speak, and you can find out about it at teachthegeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Arba. Thank you.